Okay, we're recording. Great. Okay, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is October 22nd, 2021. It's 11 a.m. and I call this meeting to order. Um, <clears throat> Just a few administrative details. Uh, our advisory subcommittee process is winding down. Um, I think at this point, only social equity is going to continue to meet on its regular schedule throughout the rest of the month. Um, we will continue to call subcommittees and the full advisory committee together um, as needed. Um, and once again, I'd just like to thank them for all of their service and dedication and commitment to this process. Today, um, once again, we begin a new phase of our work. Um, Bryn has given each of us assignments on specific decision points that um, we have researched on our own time and we are bringing recommendations to the full board um, at today's meeting and at uh, kind of this next phase of our work at future meetings. Um, and uh, today's uh, decision points are going to be around application requirements. Starting next week, we're going to start um, holding meetings twice a week uh, on Wednesdays and Fridays. The physical space will be 89 Main Street in Montpelier. We will also live stream these meetings and record them and post them to our website. All the agendas um, will be available on our website and um, there's also a way to sign up for kind of uh, to add your name to our distribution list if you'd like them emailed to you as well. Um, we're going to continue to hold our after hours public comments meetings, um, you know, on the last Tuesday of each month. Uh, the next one is on t this coming Tuesday, the 26th. The 6th. And the link um, will be available on our website if you'd like to join. Physical space will be our office, uh, 89 Main Street. So before we turn to the agenda, I'd like to. Um, ask Bryn to give us a quick uh, executive director's update. Um, sure thing. So this is just going to be very brief. Um, I wanted to remind everybody, kind of repeat our notification that the board made last week um, that due to a back-end operating system upgrade by the Agency of Digital Services, um, we did lose some website content between October 4th and October 14th. Um, all of the content to our website that was edited um, or submitted during those 11 days was lost in the operating system upgrade, including uh, public comments, but not limited to public comments. So as a result, the board encourages anybody who submitted a public comment during the period between October 4th and October 14th to submit that comment again. And as Chair Pepper just mentioned, the board is going to have an after hours public comment period next Tuesday, October 26th, from 6 to 7. And that's another way to um, reach the board and submit your comments. Um, my other, the other thing I wanted to uh, remind everyone of is that the board put out an RFI um, for the Adult Use Cannabis License Application Portal and Database Project. Um, and we put that out on October 5th. And that is the first step in our process towards soliciting proposals um, for a web portal for our licensing software, public facing database, and other software needs that the board is going to have as we stand up the regulated market. Um, that RFI has been posted to the um, Buildings and General Services website and also our social media pages. And it's also on our website. And so far we've received several responses. Responses to the RFI are due today. Um, but as a reminder, no vendor is going to be pre-qualified, um, exempted, or selected based on their response or non-response to the RFI. And that's all I have. Great. Um, has everyone had an opportunity to review the minutes from 10 and 15? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'd take a motion to approve the minutes. Approve the minutes. Motion to approve the minutes of 10 15. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Um, all right, let's turn to the agenda then. Um, so again, today we're going to look at our application requirements for all of our license types. And I'm going to start with um, a discussion around provisional licenses. Again, these are the licenses that um, a person would get prior to receiving their full license um, and allow them to kind of make some have some guarantee from the board 
that they will um, ultimately receive a license. So I'm just gonna pull this up. So just in making my, um, In making these, bringing these recommendations before you all, here's the kind of the things that I did, um, you know, kind of on my own time. I reviewed the application requirements in Massachusetts and New Jersey, both of which have this kind of conditional slash provisional licensing process. Um, and so I thought, you know, looking at what they did would be informative. With respect to the use of criminal history records, um, I did kind of, I looked at a somewhat old 2018 summary of all the uh, adult use states that included Alaska, California, Colorado, Massachusetts, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington, um, and looked, and I'll have a summary of those when we get to it. Um, I also met with Jen Flanagan from Vermont, uh, or sorry, uh, VS Strategies. Um, I met with Bryn and David. I have met multiple times with Department of Financial Regulation, Department of Tax, Office of Professional Regulation and VSECU, which currently banks with our existing dispensaries. And then we also, I also held a banking roundtable in September um, with any, the invitation went out um, to kind of DFR's mail, mailing list about any banking institution that might be curious about cannabis. So we got solicited some feedback from various financial institutions. So, this is uh, related to provisional, my first couple slides are related to this provisional licensing process. The way that I see this is what we would want to do on a provisional licensing basis is ensure that wh whoever's applying um, doesn't have anything in their history or any associations that would be categorically disqualifying. You know, I don't need to know, we don't, as a board, I don't think we need to know things like location of the establishment or that they've, secured their local permitting. What we need to know is that this organization, this entity um, can comply with the coal memo. And I know it's been rescinded, but the FinCEN guidance is kind of, uh, you know, incorporated a lot of the coal memo points. Um, and then we have these two other additional, um, you know, disqualifying events that are part of Act 164, that the applicant presently poses a threat to public safety or the proper functioning of the regulated market. And then we also have the ownership limitations. This is the kind of one license per applicant rule. So all of the kind of recommendations that I made are to try and get at whether one of these disqualifying um, events is in an applicant's you know, history. So what I see for the provisional license is you have to designate the type of license you're seeking, um, including the tier. Um, and if, if you're doing a cultivation license, you'd have to distinguish between indoor and outdoor. Um, documentation that the cannabis establishment is, a regis is registered to do business in Vermont. Um, the federal tax identification number. Um, you know, some of the folks that I talked to also said that we should include social security numbers on this. Um, um, just by way of reference, all of these um, came from Massachusetts. Uh, so this is all part of the Massachusetts kind of provisional licensing process. Um, information about the cannabis establishment, including its legal name, articles of organization and bylaws, all people having direct or indirect control, um, any kind of contractual relationship that conveys direct or indirect control, um, any um, individual um, who's named as part of this, these other recommendations also has to disclose any interest in another application in Vermont. So this would be trying to get at that one license per applicant rule. Um, and uh, also documentation about for everyone named whether they have an interest in a organization or a cannabis establishment outside of Vermont. And I think this really speaks to kind of some coal memo and FinCEN priorities. We would want to know if there's any negative actions or, you know, license denials or anything that's happened in another jurisdiction um, for any of the entities that have direct or indirect control. 
And then also um, a list of anyone who's contributed capital resources. I think probably we should limit this to above 10% um, to the cannabis establishment, whether they have direct control or indirect control or not. So that's slide one. Slide two, this is more provisions. So criminal and administrative history records um, for everyone um, who's listed kind of in the application. And I have a separate slide on what information we're gonna request in order to get that criminal and administrative history records. Um, assign authorization to share the info with appropriate agencies. Um, proof that anyone who's significantly involved or has a financial interest is over 21 years old. Um, and of course there's a catch-all, any other requirements that we deem necessary. So the, the one that I really wanted to talk to you all about is also confirmation of tax compliance, which is a prerequisite of most licensure in Vermont. This is a sticky subject um, because we have this legacy cash issue and we have this issue of cannabis profits that people likely have not been paying taxes on. And yet we're actively trying to incorporate them into the regulated market. So I'm curious what we want to do on this. This is the one piece where I feel like, you know, all this other stuff is pretty objective and I'm happy to take recommendations on anything else, but this is one where I think we're going to need to discuss whether this is necessary, whether it's necessary for all license types and what we should do specifically about cannabis profits. So I'm wondering if it's necessary for the provisional part of the process and, um, you know, because what, what people can do is then make an agreement with the Department of Taxes, right? So if in the provisional process they don't have to disclose that, but for licensure they do, is that significantly different or is that... So I think that could be a way to do it. Um, the, the problem that I think we might run into is that if someone is entering into an agreement with the State Department of Taxes, then they have to also do something on the federal side. Okay they're kind of like admitting that they haven't been paying taxes. Right. Um, and I just wonder what that, impl if that implicates them in a federal tax evasion scheme. How have, um, in your conversations, how have other states approached this? So when I spoke to Jen, um, they specifically disqualified people with cannabis dispensing offenses because of this very reason. Mm -hmm. Of course, I think that's not where we want to go. Um, I think we actively, you know, our social equity applicant criteria, for instance, includes cannabis dispensing offenses. So we would, on the one hand, be saying you're a social equity applicant, and on the other hand, we're saying you're categorically disqualified unless you paid your taxes. So maybe what I don't know is, is what would, what would cause the Department of Taxes to know that someone didn't pay taxes? So if they've been operating in cash, they, you know, that, unless it was in a bank account somewhere that may not be disclosed, I can see where there might be other income or somebody didn't file their taxes that we might ask them to then write that. But I'm wondering if, if there's any documentation or record that they've, or are you saying that because now they're saying, okay, I've been doing this and I'm bringing experience to this, obviously I made, income somewhere I, I think where it would get tricky is if someone had a conviction for dispensing or trafficking of cannabis yeah. and there's no tax record for them yeah. you know um, yeah there's gonna be a lot of different I think unique situations based off folks that have been participating in the legacy market are they doing so as their primary source of income their only source of income or are they doing so as a supplemental source to their full tax abiding uh, nine to five job, you know what I mean? And, and from that perspective, I think if somebody's tax compliant or their business is tax compliant, separate from their interest in being a legacy grower, what can we really do other than, than look at what they've presented to the tax department with respect to them being personally compliant and, and if they have a business separate from, you know, cannabis production, they're also compliant there as well. But what did you say would trigger on the federal side? 
I'm just, it was Ray, I, when I was talking to one of those folks, they just said, you know, because I thought, well, couldn't you just have some sort of state plan worked out or some sort of true up amount that people pay just so you don't have to detail every every transaction ever. You could just, or all the income, you could just say $500 and, yeah. you know, we'll wipe the slate clean. Um, the person I was talking to, I forget who it was exactly, just said, no, because then you're essentially admitting that you haven't been paying taxes, and you can clear yourself on the state side, but then are you opening yourself up to federal liability for for not paying taxes? Well, I definitely don't want to put people at risk federally, um, so maybe we don't need the tax compliance. I would say um, this might be an issue for our banks and others, our financial institutions. Maybe they can have their own, you know, yep. their own requirements. I'm wondering if we should say something along the lines of you're in compliance with taxing, kind of like what you were saying, Kyle, on everything else except for maybe illicit profits related to cannabis. Um, um, so, and maybe we do it that way maybe we require it for you know integrated license holders or for retailers that they need to be 100 percent tax compliant you know yeah we'll never get the legacy market we hope to capture if we require too much of it on the cultivation end yeah but i like that there's sort of a balance that you've struck there yeah. between everything that is not cannabis related i have reported in right of okay. course, I didn't report the cannabis related stuff. Right. Okay. So I'm going to change this to confirmation of tax compliance except for cannabis profits. And we can, I can't change it in real time, but I think it's probably taking yeah. notes. Okay. Okay. Can we go back to the FinCEN yes. and call memo for a second? I'm wondering how this, um, how this works with our social equity plans. Are there, is there conflict here between some of like the preventing revenue from the sale of marijuana going to criminal enterprises and, and some of this may be my, my ignorance about certain uh, language, but you know, if we're asking, if we're saying that under our social equity plan that we are inviting people in who have otherwise had cannabis offenses, is this, when you're presenting this, are you talking about going forward? I think you were talking about their history, right? I was, yeah, I mean, I have a slide on how we should deal with criminal history offenses, um, criminal historic convictions, but we do need to have something, you know, I think that's where you get to all the ownership interests and financial interests to make sure that everyone who's participating moving forward isn't diverting to some sort of criminal organization. Right, of course. Yeah. Um, just for members of the public, we, we are going to have a public comment period, um, so it's but not, not for a little while, just just putting it out there. Um, Can I ask you a, a question, Pepper? And yep. I think it might have been on your, your next slide. I'm thinking about direct control or an indirect control. Yep. And just, I, I'm wondering your thoughts on what indirect control means. I'm just trying to get your thoughts, or our thoughts on the record because some folks in this provisional license, I would imagine will seek business technical legal assistance in doing so, but and we can put together guidance documents on what a lot of these terms mean, but for the folks listening and, and everybody that might tune in at some point, what does indirect control mean from a ownership perspective here? So um, this is one of those terms where I think if we understand the concepts, then we can define it specifically in, in role. Um, but yeah, I think it would be, and it, 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 this, is, this comes from Massachusetts that has a definition of an entity having indirect control, so we could also pull that up. But okay. it would really be, I think, if you had some sort of veto authority, but you're not involved in day-to-day -day operations, but okay. you, um, you know, it's written into your kind of ownership agreement that you can control certain decision points. And that yeah. makes sense. I just, I'm yeah. assuming we'll have a number of small businesses that understand that nucleus right. and who might have indirect control and be a non-voting or voting member of right. an organization, but folks aren't gonna have, depending on the size of the business and perspective employees down the road, you know, right. things could change. Just wanna make sure people understood. And for the provisional process, we expect applicants to have some of this information, but 
potentially not all, right? Like they're. I'm really. I think part of the goal was so that people could go and get. Yeah. Yeah. So what I would say on that piece is I don't assume that everyone seeking a provisional license will know all of their business arrangements because right. they, they might need the provisional license to go out and get some more investors, for instance. However, I would say that, that would, those new investors might make you categorically disqualified mm -hmm. eventually. So the provisional license kind of says, you know, at this point in time, based on this information, you can move forward. If the this, if this circumstances change, as in if you're bringing on new people with direct or indirect control, they'll have to go through this process. So um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a point in time, you're, you're good with, the, you know, with this folk, with these people. Um, if you change the circumstances too much, then you might not be able to convert your provisional license into a full license with those new people that you've added. Okay, that makes sense. And on the denials, you talked about business interests in other jurisdictions, and I think you mentioned like denials in other jurisdictions. I assume we would consider what their denying license is right. based on, which right. probably we would have than ours, yeah. exactly. That's why that's how I see this is really like you know we just need to know, and if there is some sort of adverse administrative employment action or something else going on, this would be our opportunity to to know about that and to and, and have give us discretion to determine whether or not it would be categorically disqualifying for a Vermont license. Okay. I mean, is that how you all are thinking about the provisional licensing process? Just kind of like do the kind of record checks and the financial checks and just make sure that, you know, there's nothing that we see that would automatically disqualify someone from licensure. Yes, knowing that they might have to come back with additional information right. if they have new investors, new record checks and so right. forth at the, when they do the actual licensing right. process. Yeah. yeah, and I even like it from the perspective of keeping it broad, just if we're talking about cultivation from an indoor outdoor perspective yeah. and not having them pick certain tier spam calling yeah. me sorry <laughs> um, because going through this provisional license process they might understand with a little bit more specificity on, on what they can do from a cultivation perspective yeah what's your thought on the 10 percent of direct or indirect control I think in Massachusetts has that same, um, so it's baked into their direct and indirect control definitions. I think our legislation actually is pretty good on defining who might be an interested party or significantly interested party or having direct or indirect control. Mm -hmm. But certainly the 10% is the threshold that, that I would want. I think, you know, generally speaking, DFR requires a 20% ownership, so this is more, this is more intensive than that, but I think we would tie that into these definitions. Do you think that the value of the ownership makes a difference, whether it's 10% or more or 1% or more? No, I think, I think you could have less than 10%, but you might still have direct or indirect control. So I think, you know, I think trying to figure out, like I, this is gonna take some further clarification. I think conceptually though, if you have over a 10% interest or you have some sort of controlling authority that's been conveyed to you by the entity, then we need to know about you. Okay. Does this seem too onerous for folks? I mean, you know, I think most small cultivators will be sole proprietorships, so I don't think that that's going to be too onerous for a small cultivator. And, and, you know, it's these larger grow facilities, it's the larger retailers that I think yeah. this could get you know, pretty prescriptive, but I think these yeah. are all, these are all kind of FinCEN yeah. slash uh, Cole Memo um, directives. And I think on, on first blush, if you're looking at the text of what's required, you might think it's a lot, but as you reference, if you're a small cultivator, you start knocking these off pretty quickly. It shouldn't be overly yeah. burdensome, I think. Okay. Well, I think we, before we take any real votes on this, I think we should also look at some of the criminal and administrative history records, because this is going it to, it's tied into this. So, suitability standards for licensure. There's a couple of different models that are out there. Um, one is kind of a 
give full discretion to the board to figure out um, whether a crime or a conviction should be disqualifying. OPR, for instance, does this. They say, you know, any conviction that's related to the practice of the profession or a felony. So felonies are disqualifying. And then they have discretion to say, or a crime related. They don't have a list of crimes. And I know that the, the legislature, uh, our legislature, thinks that that can be an unfair process. Um, it provides too much discretion to kind of the oversight body. Um, and it doesn't put people on notice. You know, you could go to nursing school, for instance, pay a lot of money and then find out, oh, I can't get licensed as a nurse because of some conviction in my past. So um, what other states have done, you know, they, they kind of have either, um, and these are all specific to cannabis, um, they, they kind of have a model of either having a felony, um, a look back period for felonies, um, a look back period for misdemeanors, um, and then some of them have enumerated lists like these crimes. The, the problem with the enumerated list is you sometimes get into this problem of trying to compare an out-of-state crime, the elements of an out-of-state crime with an in-state crime, and to see if they're substantially similar. Like, you know, not everyone's crimes, state crimes are the same. So, you know, we could have an embezzlement felony charge, for instance, and, you know, in Vermont, it means, that, you know, you have to have these elements, but some of them are missing in Arizona. Um, and so if someone's applying from Arizona, is that crime substantially the same as our crime? Um, so in some ways, having an enumerated list is not a real kind of benefit. Um, there's, it's, it's easy enough to, to navigate, but it's, it's not as straightforward as you might think. Um, California does the kind of OPR model, anything substantially related to the qualifications, functions, or duties of the business. I feel like that feels like a, I don't know what your preference is, but that general statement I feel like is pretty general yeah. you know what I mean yeah. and it could <laughs> right it could mean a lot of different things depending on the business it'd be a slippery slope so I can just cut to the chase here I, I have a combination of all of these and I can just kind of pull it up for you um, so I would say that someone is presumptively disqualified and again there's a way to overcome that presumption um, which I have on the next slide but um, you know, we again have to look at the proper functioning of the regulated market and offenses related to public safety. That's the charge. You know, we're allowed to get, we're allowed to look at criminal history records, and we can't deny anyone unless it relates to the proper functioning of the regulated market or a threat to present threat to public safety. I think it is. Um, so, to me, presumptively disqualifying convictions. Um, would be any state or federal offense uh, involving fraud, deceit, or embezzlement, and that would be um, kind of Cole Memo, proper functioning regulated market. Any other offense that implicates the Cole Memo, you know, I, I think one of the Cole Memo um, restrictions is that you can't be diverting to children, so we could look at, dis like, it could be presumptively disqualifying if you have a dispensing to youth um, conviction. Um, the trafficking of regulated substances. So again, there's a difference between mere dispensing and trafficking. Trafficking involves a larger quantity. Um, so, and I exclude cannabis from that. So um, offenses related to public safety. Um, and again, I'm, we, I'm excluding nonviolent drug offenses from that. Just have a simple look back um, for misdemeanors, Anything older than two years, we don't care about. For felonies, anything older than five years, we don't care about. And you see there's this listed, non-listed um, category that's in here. The listed offenses are defined by statute in Vermont. Um, I think there's 33 of them. Um, and they essentially are interpersonal, um, usually violent crimes. There's an element of violence in them. Um, certainly an element of interpersonal. They're, they're not property crimes for the most part. So I would say if you have a listed offense or if you have an offense, uh, a misdemeanor within the last two years or a felony within the last five years or you have any of those top three um, offenses, then you move on to this next slide. 
Can I ask again about the Cole Memo piece? Yeah. Because I see that one of the Cole Memo in, in that Cole Memo list is um, preventing violence and use of firearms in the cultivation and distribution of right. marijuana. So um, here's where I need a little education. So if somebody was cultivating and has a charge for that but then had weapons in their home, could they have a charge that in their background includes both of those things and then they would be precluded from entering the market now? Well, there, no one is categorically precluded well, from criminal history records. You just move to a higher level right. of review. Um, but tech, yeah, potentially, yes. If you're a prohibited person who's owning a firearm and you have a charge for that, a conviction for that, and, um, it's, and we decide it's related to your cannabis involvement, then I think that that could be presumptively disqualifying. And then we would move towards this slide where we consider evidence of rehabilitation. And so this is the criteria that Massachusetts has. Um, I'm not wedded to it, but I think it actually gets at a lot of the, um, the a lot of the things that you would look at if you were, for instance, a state's attorney looking at an expungement application. Um, and so to me, this is kind of a decent list. And so anyone who has any of those presumptively disqualifying offenses, they would then submit to the board evidence of rehabilitation. And we, would, we could look at all of these and decide, okay, this person could clearly participate in this without any problem. Any thoughts on any of this? Uh, I'm pretty comfortable with your proposal. Mm -hmm. I think having this, um, you know, opportunity for review or appeal, whatever we want to call it, if somebody is presumptively found to not qualify for us to kind of make that case by case recommend or, you know, ability to seek a license um, is important. Just recognizing that people find themselves in unique situations. And if you look at this one, it pretty much brings in elements of all of these. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think it's probably more lenient um, on the use of criminal history records than any other state. I mean, I don't have the list of enumerated disqualifying offenses for the two states that have them, but um, I really do think that this strikes a balance between what's required for proper functioning and present risk to public safety, and it puts people on notice pretty well which offenses implicate those and and it gives everyone a potential path yeah no i i agree i think we'll have to to spell out in guidance what those cole memo implications yeah. or yeah. you know issues could be for some folks who might find themselves in the situation like julie mentioned yeah. so they know i have questions about the how but i think that we will get to that at some point <laughs> Yeah, like, I mean, you know, how, what information we give, how we give it, right? Um, you know, or get it, and how, you know, what we're using to consider and who it is that's doing that consideration. Yeah, we could change this first one, any state or federal offense, including fraud, deceit, or embezzlement, to felony convictions for fraud, deceit, or embezzlement, because there are some pretty minor, petty crimes that involve could involve fraud like writing a, a, a bad check for instance yeah. you know yeah. um and so we could change that to just felony convictions i'd be certainly comfortable with that i'd be comfortable with that change yeah okay um and then just this is the kind of specific information that i that i think we need in order to get at any criminal administrative history. So nothing to, uh, you know, no one that I passed this through saw any real kind of like glaring omissions or any red flags. That these are all the FBI and yeah. the CIC requirements, right? These, these specifically came from Massachusetts, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, the, they're all kind of copied and pasted from one another. Looks fine to me. Okay. Um, is there anything else? Uh, 
I remember our order. Yeah. Off the top of my head. I think next is Julie. Julie. so surprised when like you plug it in and it works <laughs> um, so I looked at sort of the I looked at a couple things one was the um, baseline application requirements um, and the baseline requirements for um, an operating plan and then also um, buffer zones so I, I'll kind of start with how I um, I'll start with my line of thinking just so that you all can follow along. So I looked back at our mission and vision and tried to think about what we can accomplish through our application process that directly ties to that. You know, uh, what related to social equity in terms of like accessibility, um, what related to small cultivators in terms of how, you know, how much we're asking them to document and require, um, and all of those types of things. So I looked at what our mission and vision and our sort of ultimate goals were. Um, thought about those, looked at the directives in um, Act 164, and did a regional comparison, what Maine and Mass are doing. Um, looked at some uh, states that have some experience who've probably retooled their applications over time. I looked at more states than this. These are just sort of the ones that I looked at chiefly. And then I looked at our RFI, um, thinking, so at the end, all of this has to go into a system that's usable. Um, some just outset general considerations that um, I think we want to have in mind for this conversation is that ease of use um, and the guidelines that we'll ultimately develop. So everything we decide we want to put in the application, what is that going to look like to the end user and will they understand and what do we need to do so that they can understand what's required. Um, we should also probably consider some level of translation services and accessibility for um, folks with disabilities um, and constantly considering our alignment with uh, values and mission and what other information do we want to collect? So while we have someone filling out paperwork, which most people don't like to do, what else can we collect um, at that time that might be good for benchmarking for us? So in terms of the baseline application requirements, you know, all applications should include, and, in, and also I, um, I looked at this as the, you know, after the provisional licensing, you know, people have gone out, they've gotten their investors, they've gone most of the way. This is sort of like the last step in their process. Yeah. Um, and also, I should note that absent from this are the details about social equity applications because we have more, I think, feedback and work to do on those specifics in terms of this part of it. But all should include some um, confirmation of local approval, uh, compliance with local zoning bylaws, or an agreement to remedy any outstanding issues that they have before opening, compliance with buffer zones, which I'll talk about in a moment if we decide to have uh, something on those, um, business re uh, registration with the Secretary of State's office, which I think is going to be required for multiple lines of, of the application, um, and then any required insurance, so workers' compensation, general liability, and any other insurance that's required based on that particular type of business. Um, I had in here proof of standing with the Vermont Department of Taxes. We've had that conversation now. Um, documentation of possession of the business location, so their lease agreement or purchase agreement. Um, completion of any required inspection, so if there's a local or state agency that needs to inspect the premises before it can be occupied, um, if fire safety needs to inspect it, or if the Department of Health needs to inspect it for some reason, um, or any other state agency. This was just a for example list. And then I think we also want proof that they've already registered with any sort of third-party tracking system that we decide that um, is part of our regulations and demonstration that their POS system, because I think we've talked about that, mm -hmm. compliance and enforcement, is, is going to read with the other systems that we're asking it to. Um, certainly completion of any trainings or certifications required by the regulations, the background check release, so if they have additional folks that they need to have background check before opening. Um, and then there should be a series of acknowledgments. The reasonable care, there was one state that had a reasonable care acknowledgement saying, I'm submitting this application and I, you know, I, I have done my best effort in making sure that all these people are, uh, that are on this list are able to be part of this program. 
Um, and then certainly a statement of truth truthfulness, which I think you're going to talk about, right. Pepper. And then, uh, you know, other census data that's confidential. Um, we, I think we should consider what type of data we want, uh, whether it's gender identity or race or income or other things that we might want to be able to demonstrate what the market looks like. Um, and part of this is also t tying back to our social equity. Like, we'll have, you know, some of this data for our social equity applicants, but you know, do we need it in a broader scale? And I think the answer to that is, is probably yeah. yes. Yep, I agree. Yeah, again, I'm all for collecting data and information so long as we have a plan to use it. Yes, and it would need to be, and this is where, I mean, I didn't specifically list it because I don't know what our systems are going to be capable of, but it would need to be something that's collected separately from their application. Because we don't need to know that a particular licensee, except for social equity applicants, has a particular sort of identity, but we might want to know on a broad scale right. what the identities of sure. our applicants are. Yep. Um, so some of that would be pending what our systems are able to do for us. Great. Um, do you want me to move on to buffer zones? I have a, I have a question, yeah. and just in, in you, you're thinking about this, and, and as we think about um, reasonable care and then even uh, moving back to um, local acknowledgement, local approval. Have, did you contemplate any thoughts on like a, a, a community action outreach plan for prospective license holders? And I'm thinking like in, in the retail sense, I think other jurisdictions, some required, or I know some folks who work in ancillary businesses with, with these businesses, whether it's through auditing or marketing or so on and so forth, ask these folks to help unpack how they intend to be part of their local community. And I'm just wondering your thoughts there. So I, I did, and I think that that's probably part of their um, operations plan, okay. more so than the, the general baseline cool. application. Um, I, I would imagine that that would be part of sort of their general business plan. And I think that there is some outreach that we need to do um, that's outlined in the legislation to support businesses and understanding what it is we're looking for. Okay. I know that these businesses want to be considered part of the community, yes. not just um, a, a cannabis dispensary on the peripheral of right. a municipality. So, how do we use carrots to yeah. to you know foster that kind of relationship where there may be tension in certain municipalities? I do know that there are some states that require a community meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't. I considered that for this, and ultimately decided that I think that most of those processes are already in place. Yeah, if they're up So if there's a yeah. permit, if, the, if you're having, if you're going to, if your permit's going to be approved by your local select board, then there's already a public comment period in place. The zoning board, the public comment periods are, so there's already options within our existing systems for people to, to share their concerns if they have them about a business in their, in their community. Okay. And for the business to respond. Okay. Is um, is the kind of like record keeping, cash management stuff in, in your presentation like the kind of like operating plan? I don't necessarily no. have language. I okay. mean, I. Mine I was have just, yeah, yeah. Right. mine right. was just the additional yeah. checklist yeah. items. Yeah, called to be Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So just if we're ready, yep. go on yep. to so um. I mentioned buffer zones before, so we'll move on to that. I, um, I've had multiple conversations with folks in the you know, medical and, and prevention community and um, kind of looked back at our, our vision again, I looked at a variety of other states. Most of those are you know, 500 to 1,000 square feet mm -hmm. from a school. Some define school as daycare. They also include houses of worship. Um, it really does run the gamut. Um, an organization called Getting It Right from the Start in their local um, score uh, scorecard, they give full points for any locality that has 600 feet or more from a school, and that I believe said K through 12 school. Prevention Works recommended um, a thousand feet from both schools and um, any places where children gather. What I'll share with you all, um, and this is a recommendation that's absolutely up for discussion. 
um, is a buffer zone of 500 feet to be measured from the property boundary of a K through 12 school. So think about what a property boundary of a school is beyond, so it would be the edge of the athletic field, yeah. um, you know, or whatever that property boundary is, to the property boundary of a cannabis establishment. Mm -hmm. Uh, measured along the normal right of way. So what I hear the concern is, is that is children passing, you know, or people passing a cannabis establishment. So I'm not sure if it matters. You know, I'm thinking of the different schools in my area or around Vermont that I've been to. I'm not sure if it matters if a cannabis establishment is through the woods, beyond the athletic fields, and in a part of town that someone's never going to walk by so much as right next to the school. I think that's, the, that's what we're trying to get at. So that's why I recommended that. Um, and I also, you know, we heard in the um, municipal roundtable that towns would like the ability to, to make some decisions for their community because the landscape of the communities are so different. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm also recommending that a town may reduce the buffer zone by local zoning ordinance or increase it but not more than 1,000 feet. Um, I think one of the issues, and I did K through 12 schools, one of the issues that I had, including child cares or places of worship, is that those places, I mean, child cares in particular sometimes are in retail storefronts, and they might arrive and then leave, you know, and the cannabis establishment might be there longer. So I just, I wasn't... I wasn't convinced that that particular age group was particularly at risk, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, the pre-K yeah. and younger. Um, and I wasn't convinced that um, that was something we could actually ultimately track yeah. um, in any meaningful way. Right. Is there any data that you review that kind of, that you can glean from that how effective buffer zones really are? So most of that data is really about advertising. Right. Right. So when I look at buffer zones, I think, okay, here's the location. The next conversation we have to have is what can that location have in the window right. or on the storefront? What does the advertising look like? So, and I think that's kind of what I'm gleaning from reading about tobacco and alcohol too. So for buffer zones for cannabis establishment, we already know that you can't be in the establishment if you're under 21, right? right. But that's not true for places that sell alcohol mm -hmm. necessarily, except for maybe the state liquor stores um, or, or tobacco. So kids are walking into a convenience store and are still exposed to the advertising where that may not be true inside a cannabis establishment. So what's on the outside? You know, I think we need to have a conversation when we get to advertising probably sandwich boards within a thousand feet of a school probably shouldn't yeah, be allowed, right. that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've driven by the dispensary in Montpelier a thousand times, never even knew it was there until someone told me that, <laughs> which building it was the other day. Um, I, I like your, no, no matter where we land in this conversation of, of a buffer zone, I, I like the ability for towns to either reduce especially in small towns where the whole town is within a mm -hmm. couple city blocks. Um, you're never going to, I don't want these, if we're trying to uh, normalize a lot of cannabis usage um, and kind of unlock the fear that a lot of folks still have, forcing them in, outside of their communities into certain areas is not something I really want to see happen. So um, I think allowing towns to make that decision for themselves from a buffer perspective, knowing their makeup better than we do is, mm -hmm. is something that's important. And that's precisely what happened in the municipal roundtable. There were towns that said, please make the buffer zone a thousand feet because we are, you know, a densely populated city. And then there were smaller towns that said, can we have no buff buffer zone because we would like to be able to, we only have one small downtown and that's our only place for an establishment. Mm -hmm. And this is to, I only considered this for retail establishments. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I just want them, I want retail establishments to feel like they're being treated as part of their community um, and not some monster in the corner. Well, for, for me, when I was thinking about buffer zones and how we should be thinking about this, I went back to the governor's um, commission, his marijuana commission's report, and they said, do one of two things. One, follow the kind of state um, 
what is it, the state law on selling on school grounds, a kind of drug-free school zone law, um, or do what they're doing for the medical dispensaries. Um, and so this actually, this proposal threads the needle between those two, actually. So the, the state drug-free zone, school zone, is 500 feet from the edge of the border, or of the school property. And then, um, and it's just re restricted to K through 12 schools. Um, and then the dispensary rule is a uh, thousand feet from, what is a thousand feet from a school or a childcare facility. And that is like as the crow flies, right? right? Like a yeah. radius. So right. uh, Massachusetts has something like that, but they've also defined what a barrier is. So yeah. if there's like a river or a mountain or a right. highway, like that doesn't count. Right. I, I was trying to not yeah. be quite so prescriptive. No, I think, I think this to me is the kind of reasonable middle ground between those two, and it makes a decent amount of sense to me, and it allows some flexibility. Um, so I'm, I support this. Great. I support it too. Excellent. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> <laughs> are we talking about any, are we talking about operating plans? Net? I don't have yes. the list. Okay. Yes, that sounds good. All right, I will carry up. on then. All right. So um, the legislation requires that businesses submit to us an operating plan and it has some prescription of what must be included in that. Um, I think there's other information that we want to capture. So of course, main point of contact, um, business name and what they intend to do business as, their type of organization and the organizing documents, so corporation, yeah. corporation documents, so that sort of thing. I think for us, particularly in the first uh, round, we're going to want a timeline for opening. Um, I think about that um, market structure spreadsheet, which is complicated and lovely but had all of that random um, and so I think that timeline for opening will help us with that and then um, location and I think by the time folks are submitting an operating plan they've gone pretty far in their thought process um, on this so we want an executive summary that has a business overview their hours of operation um, and also in my imagination and this may not be true like some of this goes through the town as well like the town when they're approving gets to see this which is why I included hours of operation because they do have the ability to uh, write zoning rules about that um, and then of course I think we want some uh, description of the products and services to be sold um, for certain uh, entities their pricing strategy and payment options um, you know, and the, the types of, like, for testing, the types of testing to be operate, uh, to be done. And then I think Kyle's going to talk more about, like, the cultivation, so I won't speak to that. Um, we'll want organization and uh, management information, so all of the owners and affiliates, but also um, the types of position and staffing levels and their general roles and responsibilities and the decision-making structure, if it's substantially different than the way, you know, like if it's a corporation, for example, um, and the reason for that is, it, for that, for me, that ties back to the social equity. So we want to know that a social equity applicant is um, actually part of the decision-making structure, and they can speak to that in a business plan. And then, of course, the hiring uh, training plan, including safety training um, and the responsible vendor training that will require them to do. And then general compliance plans, um, compliance plans for sanitation, materials handling, um, storage and record keeping and how they'll control their inventory. Um, and a general, and so this is probably more general than the banking information that I think you're going to speak to. Um, in my mind, this is sort of like a general overview of their business, um, their general sources of capital throughout, like their plan for the year, um, their financial projections for the year, any banking relationships that they have, um, and what they intend to invest in their business um, if they have a plan for that for the first year or for the year. I think this would be a good time for the um, organizations to submit any advertising and marketing plan that they have so that um, we can approve that at the time of licensing. Um, and then I would really like, and this was in some of the, um, it was spoken to mostly in financial information, but I would really like to see business that businesses have thought through some sort of emergency shutdown or um, staffing or supply chain interruption 
um, or an abrupt business closure. We probably all think of businesses in our, our communities that have just suddenly shut their doors. So what happens to the contents inside the business? Yeah. Um, and again, not necessarily specifics, but I think we're going to want to see that people have thought through this. Um, yeah, I've got a similar point on one of yeah. my slides, but I actually like this better. So. Well, I think there's the money that they set aside right. for a wind down, and then there's um, I can think of at least one business right. in my community that just shut the doors. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there may have been money for a wind down, but it right. didn't get used. You yeah. know? Right. I got one question, if you want to go back a couple of slides. Sure. I think to 10, maybe. Yeah, so products and services, and I'm just thinking out loud and, and how, I'm just curious as to how you think the retailers for products to be sold, pricing strategy, um, how, how specific do we want to be in understanding products being sold, recognizing products being sold could change over time, many times over in the span of even a year, depending on consumer preference and market dynamics? So to me, this is conceptual. Okay. You know, like if, if a, a retailer intends to provide both CBD and THC products and also perhaps sell dab break, or not dab breaks because that's not, but pipes or something. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah, that. gotcha. You know, I think it's a general concept. Okay. I just didn't know if it was something that we would require them to update in like a renewal, you know, well, situation. Well, probably like yes, I think in a renewal, but I don't think that they have to be... I don't think that they have to know in December I'm going to sell this strain and then in right. February okay. I'm going to sell this strain. I think. I just yeah, I just yeah. want an understanding on how specific you thought, and I'm not against wanting to understand that from our perspective, yeah. but just how specific they need to be. Yeah. A question I have is about, um, and I think this is spoken to in the legislation, about how, because this is all proprietary, so how we may want to speak to at some point how we will keep things There's some of the stuff that I would propose in my slides that we need to yeah. make sure is confidential as well. So that's just something we'll have to figure out mm -hmm. internally and make sure that our operating platforms have that capability. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. Okay. Am I up? I think it's your turn. All right. Might be that you have to like slide it over, like it's assuming that you have two screens. You are correct. Uh. That was the problem that one time, Brandon, that we couldn't figure out. <laughs> <laughs> it's new every day. That's Where's right. Gina when we need her, right? Oh. She's <laughs> <laughs> I hit something that I shouldn't have hit, and I can't see this presentation view. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so one of the tasks that, that Bren um, gave me was to kind of think through additional kind of checklist items in addition to the kind of skeletal structure of our application that, that the two of you um, were looking at in our previous slide decks and what would make sense to be required um, specifically for cultivators for this meeting. And I just want to start out by saying that just because it's not necessarily asked of us in, in any prospective cultivators application, it doesn't mean that they still might need to go out and seek a permit with other state agencies, depending on what they're doing, mm -hmm. if they're gonna be constructing any new buildings, if they're gonna be retrofitting any new buildings, there still might be local land use permitting issues that would have to be addressed, that would not necessarily be part of what we had asked for on our initial application. So one of the first things, and this is something that I'd, I'd like to discuss, and we kind of, I kind of saw hints of this in um, both of your presentations. Um, first of all, let me back up a second. You both so eloquently described your processes and who you talked to, and I, um, I didn't catch that memo, but but very quickly I talked to 
you know, all of our consultants, the Agency of Agriculture, the Agency of Natural Resources, um, environmental auditors, third-party certifiers, and I took a lot of, uh, I gleaned a lot of information specifically on this from uh, uh, Boulder County, Colorado's kind of environmental cultivator um, additional requirements in addition to San Diego County in California and also Humboldt County in California. I also looked at um, how Canada looks to mm. ask specific information of cultivators, and that was kind of where I started to really form my opinions on how we should um, require some stuff. So I think, and you both hinted at this, um, under, recognizing that folks need land to cultivate, especially outdoors, um, an applicant, they need to indicate whether or not they own a space, and if they do, a copy of the deed, title, or right to occupy. The, the, the question that I have and, and we need to think about a little bit more substantively is if somebody's looking to rent land, not everybody's fortunate in Vermont or elsewhere to be able to own a piece of land that they can actually cultivate on site. And because we're kind of, especially for outdoor cultivators, we're, we're looking and running up because of the way the legislation works and our timelines and deadlines, we're running up into the growing season um, once we start getting to licensure. Folks may at this time not necessarily have a rental agreement already in place because they're waiting on us to signal, you know, what certain requirements may be necessary for them to actually um, decide on a parcel of land. Also, I would imagine that there's a lot of landowners that traditionally rent to agricultural usage that just have a lot of questions about cannabis on their property. And that's something that we can work um, to educate landowners, landlords, so on and so forth throughout this process to kind of make sure that there isn't any misconceptions about liability, so on and so forth. But what I was thinking was recognizing this, and, and I saw that it wouldn't necessarily be needed in a pre-application. I kind of tried to even push the envelope a little bit further. At the time of application, if somebody's still um, working on a rental agreement, do we need to know specific information about that rental agreement at the time somebody applies or can we hold off on that until somebody, you know, to submit it until they actually receive their license. So let's say the application window opens in April, they want to submit, recognizing that they don't have a rental agreement in place yet because they're still looking or working out the finer details or educating a prospective landlord. Can we still allow them to move through the licensure process and they just can't receive that license or the ability to cultivate until we actually see proof of a rental agreement. So I just wanted to, to pause there and gauge your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I understand the desire, but at some point we're just making our lives incredibly complicated. Like an application to me, a final application, should be complete before we start to review it. It shouldn't be partially open and partially complete. So I would advocate in favor of having a physical address for the location and you know, folks that don't want to sign a lease early um, can do the provisional licensing process okay. uh, and wait until they're ready to kind of submit their application. I mean, we also should, it just seems to me like we're adding too much variability um, by waiting at three different stages for someone to complete their application. Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly appreciate that. I was recognizing that this is like an equity issue, um, trying to think through the best way. And it's hard, and I start off with it because it's hard to give us latitude and longitude of a site if you don't have right. a site, you know, for that you've already signed up for if you don't own the land yourself. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable moving it back to at the time of full application, but I thought I'd start the conversation here to just gauge your thoughts. I'm pretty sure Massachusetts requires a site inspection before they grant a license as well. Yeah. Um, so, again, like, I know what you're saying, that we could wait until that point for the site inspection, but if, if we've reviewed an application and it's taken us, let's just say, 15 hours to review an application, and then this the applicant happens. never happens, then we've lost all of that time. Yeah, and I mean, I, I don't think we want any, you know, rogue, rogue licenses out there where there's a license that somebody owns but doesn't, or, you know, it's holds, but, to but, but isn't tied to a specific parcel of land. Um, 
I think your point is well taken, though. Once we get far enough in our rulemaking and decision making, at least when we have some initial rules, like what then do we need to do to educate people so that they can make those decisions? Right. I'm comfortable pushing this back. Um, I can't find. Things are weird on my computer. I'm pu comfortable pushing this back to that the time of full application submittal. Um, but you know, again, I thought that was a good place for yeah. us to start. And it, it, again, we're balancing being accommodating versus do we have the staffing too? It's April for cultivators too, right? Is that right? No. Small, small cultivators. Yep. Yeah, I'm just wondering if we waited any longer, would they even be? I mean, I suppose you could start later. I just, you know, we're running up against yeah. the time crunch just yeah. based on the way that our, our climate is here. And I'm hoping that our, this conversation will help start informing folks of, of what to expect, yeah. you know, but. Um, I guess I'm thinking like if we said you can, you can figure this out and submit an application to us later, would someone still have the time to grow in that season anyway? You know, or at that yeah, point, no, would they just a, have to start over next year? That's a fair point. I mean, yeah. you know, you could still be doing the same thing with an indoor landlord. That's you right. know what I mean? It's somebody true. somebody I in your, my... if you're trying to rent a warehouse to. Yeah. So, okay, I'm comfortable moving it back to at the point of full application. I just wanted, you know, that to be our starting point. Okay, so um, moving on. Um, I think it's important that we that we request the grow site address latitude and longitude. This is something that's already done with the um, hemp program, and you know, there's a couple different reasons for it. I think primarily, you know, we all understand the rural aspects of the state. There isn't cell phone service everywhere. If an inspector is going out to a farm, we want to make sure that we can find the physical plot, recognizing that they're not, you know, likely visible from the road or any anything else. So just making sure we have that. I don't need to go into this this hyperlink, but the Agency of Agriculture does have, um, I don't need to click it, folks can, can see it later, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm already having screen issues with my mouse. They've got a lot of resources on how easy it is to provide that information, um, yeah. whether it's through Google Maps or, or elsewhere to actually get, yeah. get that information. And everybody who's a registered hemp grower or has done so over the course of the last couple years has had to, had to do this, it shouldn't really be an issue. Um, again, we can uh, we can pivot my my slide from at the time of licensure to the time of full application. You talked about the school property account number. Um, yeah, this is required yeah. for everyone mm -hmm. just yeah. because of current use implications. The tax department originally thought just retailers, but then they said because of the implications on current use, they want it for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that information. Isn't hard to find, right? Okay. All of this, of course, I think not all of it, but the locations uh, should be confidential. I know we have that kind of theme throughout. Yeah. We can figure out, but certainly don't want a list of every cultivator <laughs> just somewhere. Yeah, no, absolutely not. <laughs> it's open to the public. In addition to GIS coordinates or latitude, longitude, um, I thought it's important that we get a diagram of the premises on our site plan. Um, so, you know, and, and I think we just need to normalize, you know, this would be like a drawing. I mean, think we need to think through how that can work conceptually as part of our application if we're going to do things online. But we need to get an understanding of acreage, the cultivation site, um, so on and so forth. What other buildings are going to be used as part of that, not necessarily in that specific canopy, but if you're drying, you're curing, you're doing certain stuff. You know, maybe you also have different licenses and you're doing stuff on one set of land. We need to know with respect to that, that parcel what you're doing in specific areas of mm -hmm. that. Uh, that's my perspective. And so the ways that we can normalize this kind of um, this drawing is, you know, a north arrow, size of total property in acres, total cultivation canopy dimensions, standardized scale of like, you know, two inches is a mile. I don't or that doesn't make sense for this <laughs> specific example, but you know what I mean. Um, and then use of land. And then similar to some, some of the operating plans, um, business plans, and this is something that I just think is important as we understand how folks look to whether start small and move through our, our different tiering structures for both indoor and outdoor. Um, I'd like to see a statement from cultivators on their intentions. Do they want to stay in that thousand square foot canopy designation? Do they have intentions over the next couple years to potentially move up? Maybe they're starting big and they, they you know, don't want to 
um, get any bigger, but maybe they might want to right size themselves in the future. Do they have aspirations for you know growing if federal legalization ever does happen? Do they want to just sell to the dispensary down the road, or or you know create a real you know lucrative business out of out of what they're starting? So I just you know, and this doesn't need to be you know complete. It's an aspirational statement more mm -hmm. so than anything. Conceptual. Is this a, like a if we had an online portal, would this be one of those required fields, or would this be an optional field? I'd like to see it be required. Yeah. Um, not everybody. Again, this isn't. I don't want it to come off as a formal. You need to have thought out five-year plan <laughs> style. But what are your yeah. thoughts and goals, just so we can again start to collect information on how mm -hmm. certain people are approaching this market and the future? Okay. And it sounds like for the RFI that's out there, we need to make sure that it's a system that can have scans and uploads. Yes, right. absolutely. There's going to need to be attachment, um, PDF attachments, and probably in other formats too, and, and the so forth. Do you think it will matter if those are like hand drawn, or do they have to be? I think they could be hand drawn, and then you can scan it, and you can get free apps to do that as long mm -hmm. as you upload it as part of your application. Um, in, in the final yeah. I'm just point. assuming not everyone's going to hire an architect. Right. I, I'm right. not expecting yeah. that. It's yeah. just literally <laughs> you could draw it. This is my total acreage of my farm. This yes. is where my canopy will be located. Um, and there's other crop rotating issues I think we're going to have to figure out with current use in the tax department. Yeah. Um, because I don't think you can necessarily have your cultivation site at the same spot every single year outdoors and expect the same quality product and nutrient yeah. uptake. Um, that you would have. Yeah, I'd like to see also just maybe a checkbox like, is your property under current use and is this plot within that and would this remove you from the 25 acre minimum? I'm having conversations with the tax department on current okay. use yep. starting next week. I just didn't want to wander down yeah. that a gray area of this whole conversation until I felt a little bit more fully informed yeah. and on board with what the tax okay. department is thinking. Yeah, so pending some update on current use, yeah, I think there should be some indication on this application about whether this this plot is within your current use or with that or not enrolled. Yeah, so you it know, doesn't matter for the small cultivators. I, I just need them. yeah, I just need more information from the tax department, and yeah. I don't want to at the at the risk of overthinking it, let's say your whole you have a hundred acres and it's all in current use. Yeah. You want to take a half acre yeah. out of current use. Can you just take that half acre out without penalty? Do you have to take the full amount out? Do you have to take a minimum amount? Do you have to pay the penalty? If I take half just half yeah. an acre, can I grow that thousand square foot anywhere on that half acre? So on and so forth. So this diagram may look a little different by the time yeah. we get to the full application, but I still think it's important to understand yeah. what folks are anticipating and what outbuildings are on that property that you may use as part of your 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 growing life cycle harvesting. Okay, um, moving on to to municipal water. You know, some folks are hooked up to municipal water supplies. Um, some folks have their on-site um, water and wastewater. Honestly, from my perspective and talking with ANR, um, I don't think any of our operations are going to be so big and requires so much water that many municipalities, local utilities are going to have problems servicing um, outdoor and indoor operations. But nonetheless, um, in talking with ANR, how this is typically done in other sectors is you obtain a letter from your water utility um, to make sure uh, they can supply the correct quantity. And I thought what would be most helpful is if we could develop kind of like a form letter that we can distribute to all local utilities and municipalities that they can give to us that way we're not receiving the same information that looks yeah. in different um, they in like a hundred hundred something that. yeah a yes. hundred something different forms same with municipal wastewater yeah sorry and again this rental agreement information can be adjusted um, so on-site water I think our lower tier cultivators drawing under 20,000 gallons a day groundwater and have are planning to use under 25 employees don't need to submit anything as part of um, their baseline applications um, tier five and tier six that's where you could be drawing over that I think we'd want to kind of see um, how you're complying with ANR rules um, maybe even a copy of, of permit adjusting that you might need to do for your well and sewer for irrigation purposes I just think that that's 
that's prudent. Again, tier six is being held um, additionally anyway. So if folks are looking at this larger tier five, um, they might to need to provide us some further information, but I don't think it's necessary for yeah. smaller cultivators. And Billy's taking a look at this. These these come as recommendations from ANR. ANR honestly wanted all cultivators to submit certain information. I just didn't think it was necessary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Permit triggers happen at 20,000 gallons a day. So, so okay. uh, you know, one thing that we haven't discussed as a board quite yet is co-location of multiple grow facilities in a single defined area, like a single, like a, you had like an old storage unit, like shop and you had 10 storage units that all got converted. So I think instead of saying for tiers five and six, you might say any single location that needs more, you know, any facility that like, if we do co-location, you know, right. you're, you're hooking up anything above like 25,000 or 20,000 total square feet of canopy. Okay. Or, but just, I think we don't need to change this. I just think that we should. Yeah, I mean, we can just take out larger tiers, tier five and tier six. And, and talk yeah. about it more on the, the total canopy. Total canopy. Okay. So for indoor cultivators, and apologies for my line through cultivators, that was a formatting error. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, similar to requiring a diagram of an outdoor cultivation site, some somebody may seek a specific tier of our indoor options, but we still need to know the size and square footage of that total building. I also think we should get a diagram for where that you know, and this there will be need to be again other, other um, state agencies like fire safety that you could need to come in and make sure your building is is up to code with with various different um, reasonings. But we need to see, you know, where your where your canopy is going to be, where you're storing your agricultural inputs, you know, pesticides, fertilizers, so on and so forth. If that's what you're going to use, and how you're using your space. Um, let's say you did purchase a you know 20,000 square foot facility but you're not using that 20,000 square feet I think we just still need to see and make sure we understand how that building is being used mm -hmm. um, and how you're storing stuff um, again all indoor cultivation plans should be designed so they will not cause excessive or uneconomic demands on public utilities um, you know when we're talking about indoor versus outdoor there's I think all indoor facilities need to um, provide us with wastewater and on or municipal water information. I don't think we can waive those same types of um, requirements like like I propose in the outdoor. One other thing, I forget to include it on here. Oh yes, so. Um, sorry, I skipped one of my bullets. The ability to serve letter from a servicing utility. This was discussed by PSD. This was recommended. This is part of um, every other manufacturing, you know, building um, type of industry that we have in the state. We want to make sure that that utility can service your facility without adding additional costs to ratepayers that may also be using that utility. And it's pretty common utilities do that all the time. I don't even think we need a form letter for that. It's it's. It's part of other land use planning parts of our state laws and regulations. I can't quite remember. Do the utilities, in order to determine ability to serve, need to do a site visit or can they do it remotely? I'm fairly sure they can do it remotely. Okay. So that's all I had on additional baseline requirements for, great. for cultivators. Great. I don't want to be overly burdensome, but I think just understanding a little bit more about the site and your conversations yeah. with local yeah. utilities and municipalities are important, even though they you don't, cause, especially because you don't need to be in a jurisdiction that's opted in, you know. So back to your point about relationship to the community, that's an opportunity for right. businesses to build that relationship. Right. Okay. So um, another thing that Brent asked me to take a look at was additional baseline app requirements for labs. Um, so I talked to Carrie quite extensively about this. Carrie is. Kerry Jaguer, the director at the Farm Division, um, Public Health and Resource Management Division at the Agency of Agriculture. He is the one drafting um, a lot of our regs around labs and looking at other jurisdictions and our hemp lab program to kind of make sure things um, work for this new industry. Not saying that they haven't for the hemp program, but 
I, I honestly um, changed some some words to kind of away from hemp to get more of a total cannabis um, thought into some of the way these are words are worded. Um, literally, this is the same additional application requirements that are required of our hemp program if they want to be certified as a state lab, or excuse me, not as a state lab, but a state certified lab. So um, getting your accreditation certificates, quality assurance, standard operating procedures, a master list of an analytical and non-analytical trainings, so on and so forth, a resume or a CV of all technical and management personnel, and then just uh, having a, a more of an understanding um, how you're gonna be doing the testing and certificate of analysis for um, you know, certain equipment and your organizational chart. And I thought the Agency of Agriculture built out a really extensive application and, and, yeah. and checklist and I carry and even told me it was designed with this in mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't looking to tack away from, from his thought process there. It also includes an analytical methods work list for each lab that they can fill out. Can you ask Carrie whether or not if someone, is, a lab is currently certified to do hemp, that we could just waive them in without any additional application in year one? And then we could match up those two application processes in year two? Yeah, so no, that's, they, a, that's a great idea. And, the application and the review of the, these applications, I know, is is and back and forth can be and has been extensive, yeah. and so any ways that we can, you know, shortcut that with quality in mind, right. um, and not disruption of services to our hemp community, um, but but I think we need to do more outreach to those accredited labs to yeah. gauge their interest. But I think that's a great idea because it seems like the application is the same essentially. It's it's. They shouldn't have to just submit it to two different entities, uh, is my thinking. But in year one, I, I don't know if it's an annual renewal, I think, for, for the other testing. It might be, yeah. So like they might be all happening at different times. So like, I think just year one, if you're, if you're certified hemp, you can be a certified, you can be waived in as a certified cannabis. Yeah, and I mean... The and then on your renewal, you'd have to at least submit your application to both, which shouldn't be all that onerous, but like, yeah. you know, at least the timing would be the same moving forward. Some of them, the only question or nuance there is, I believe some of the labs either choose to not do all six of these. Okay. So then um, Some only okay. do certain types. Gotcha. So I don't know if all of them do the full suite that we might expect. So we could do our, just a limited, you know, maybe just yeah. this, this piece of it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the potency here, that that difference is what drives, you know, cannabis for hemp versus cannabis for, um, you know, a high adult use market. So yeah. it, it, I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. Yeah. Great. This is good. That's all I got on... Um, additional baseline requirements. That's great. I think there's a lot of, um, I'm noticing a lot of repetitiveness in some of the things that we're asking for for specific types of applicants. So just as we're thinking about this, what can we do with our application to make it easy? Like you're talking about lining up with hemp. Yeah. But I don't, like, I don't want someone to have to upload the same information twice. Right, exactly. You know, like. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I mean, hey, that's, that's part of one of the, we, we haven't seen these presentations or talked to each other about our right. presentations until today, so I think if we see the same thing multiple places, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It means we're, we're on the same page, right? But that's, you know, three-person board where we can't really talk right. about the business of the board unless we're in this kind of setting, yeah. seeing these presentations for the first time. And I think I'm saying it so that when we get to a point where we see what those systems look like, we're still thinking about what the repetitive areas are. Mm -hmm. I will say that um, and I, I, it was noted in my presentation, but I, I can I can understand and respect that supplying a latitude and a longitude to somebody's physical growth site may may bring a little bit of skepticism to somebody who's looking to mm -hmm. come out of the legacy market. And we will work as a board to make sure that information is kept confidential because there's public safety concerns. In addition to, I'm sure folks have their own trust of us as a board concerns but you know if those if that information is discoverable 
you know, it could lead to folks trying trying to find these physical sites. And so, a big part of our RFI, our our database of information, needs to be um, able to keep these in confidence with the board. I totally agree. You don't want to just list of all the sites that's public. No, it, it creates huge, I think, security yeah, issues. Yeah, but I also think most cultivators that are interested in this understand that we need to know where they are for site inspection purposes. And, you know, no, absolutely. Yeah. Just want to make uh, assure folks that may be interested and, and skeptical that that's a priority for us. I've got one more slide on baseline application requirements. So we can do that and then we can take a break. Okay. Uh, okay. Wait, yeah, sorry. Are you more? No, no, no. Well, we need to get the priority of licenses. That's yeah. what I thought you were going. We can do that after the break, though. Yeah. So, Bryn wanted me to look at baseline applications related to uh, just banking and insurance requirements. So, um, you know, again, I met with DFR numerous times, the SCCU. Um, we had a banking roundtable. I met with the tax department. Um, met with our consultants. A lot of this just comes straight out of Massachusetts. Um, so, general liability, product liability, insurance coverage. Um, so this would mean, of course, that we're requiring general and product liability insurance. Um, this is the one that we briefly talked about, Julie. Just Massachusetts requires a bond or an escrow account mm -hmm. for wind down costs. This is, you know, still a federally illegal product, and you don't want a company to go bankrupt overnight and not have a plan for dealing with what was legally grown cannabis, and then you know have no outlet for it. So just they I, they require, I think, a minimum of five thousand. I think that's probably a little excessive for all of our license types. Um, but I think we can work out the details of exactly how much we would require or whether it's required for small cultivators, for instance. But um, I think, you know, it's a good thing for us to at least have on our, on our radar. Um, tax ID, span numbers, uh, we talked about that. Um, the criminal administrative history records, that's uh, from a prior slide. Um, authorization to release information all the documents needed for the provisional licensing. Uh, we went over that earlier. The big one um, that I would like the board to consider is whether we require essentially banking and deposit at a minimum a depository account. I can tell you from my conversations with the Vermont institutions um, that there is not a lot of uptake in people's willingness to participate in cannabis banking at least at the outset. We have one financial institution in Vermont that currently banks cannabis funds. Um, I think that they're probably going to take a very cautious approach, you know, next year with, um, so this could be a real hardship if we required it. Um, it's a, it's certainly in an ideal world, we would want this um, just so that we don't deal with an all cash industry or even a you know majority cash industry, but uh, it's probably unrealistic to demand it. I would say I think it's unrealistic to think that you know there's going to be a huge amount of banking services available to folks at at the early outset of the market. So I was thinking, what are ways around it? I mean, we certainly want to encourage having a, a, at a minimum a place to deposit your cash. Um, so I, what I was thinking is potentially you could require someone that doesn't have a financial institution or a deposit account has to demonstrate what they've done to try to get one and how they haven't been able to. Mm -hmm. You know, they could say, I talked to these three institutions and they all denied, you know, my application. Something along those lines, some demonstration that, you, that you've made an attempt. Um, and then if, if you are, if you don't have one, that you have to submit a cash management plan and that could be I'm going to take my cash to, um, I don't even know, an out-of-state institution, yeah. uh, you know, some, some sort of plan. I'm going to keep it in a safe until I can kind of have someone come pick it up. So, something. I don't know. I think that if, if there isn't an uptick in, in interest in banking, that that is the best way to manage it mm -hmm. for now. Hopefully that changes. Um, 
because it is, you know, a public safety concern. Right. It's, yeah, absolutely. I can tell you a lot of the financial institutions are looking at VSCCU um, for their compliance and enforcement because they have, they've been doing it for a number of years. It's actually, while it is diff difficult to kind of wrap your head around all of it, it's actually not that difficult when you have the template. Um, so I, I think that there will be, there will be some options event eventually. I just don't see them being robust in year one. Do you know if they've had an opportunity to speak with banks in Colorado that have done this to sort of ease the concerns that they have or understand how other banks are doing this in other states? So we had, when I did the banking round table, we had someone from Colorado come and address them. Uh, address them. I think yeah. really what they, what the, what the bankers wanted from us was some indication of what we were going to require on our application, what information we could share with them versus what they have to collect on their own, what sort of compliance we're going to require versus what they're going to have to require mm -hmm. on their own, and just how closely we're you know, meeting the coal memo priorities versus how much extra they'll have to do in order to ensure. Okay. So they're, again, like the timing's not going to work out very well for year one because they're going to wait to see what our rules are. You know, as soon as our rules are approved, we're gonna start issuing licenses. So, you know, it, it's not gonna be a lot of time for them to ramp up. Yeah. I think you probably remember Christian Saderberg yes. said that there are out of state, you know, state chartered financial institutions that are more than willing to come into Vermont to come and bank our money, but there's, you know, really high fees. Yeah. For that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, are, so you, are you proposing demonstrating hardship, or is that just a question? That, that was the question for you all. Like, do we want to require a financial institution, a a, at a minimum, a deposit account, with the caveat that if you can't get one, you have to kind of explain that you tried, and you have to have a plan for how you're going to deal with cash. If we know that there's only really one bank right now in state that's willing to? Is that just an exercise that we're putting people through to get an answer that we already know a question to? You know, I'm not positive there's only one. There's only one that's currently doing it. Um, but I think that there are some, there were banks that are very curious about this okay. and, and are, I think, actively talking to their boards about it, whether they should do this. I think we do have to have some sort of demonstration that someone tried to open an account. But okay. the thing, I, I, I do think, yeah. you know, even if it's from one or two banks. Okay. I don't think we want people to, in, in the spirit of some of those FinCEN guidelines and the coal yeah. memo, we don't want people, we don't want to give people the option to not bank at all. Sure, we, okay. You know. No, I agree, just asking the question, and then maybe, yeah. hopefully, it, upon renewal, well, we can adjust things because there won't be as much hesitation yeah. on state chartered banks. So, one layer deeper on this is we could also require de at a minimum deposit account for all retail licenses and I say that um, our Department of Tax they have discretion about whether to accept cash payments of uh, the taxes um, they haven't made the final determination but I would I would bet that they say no no cash payment in, in tax money um, which means that those retailers are going to have to have, whether they like it or not, a depository account. Well, then so wouldn't everybody else. I mean, if you're paying unemployment tax, if you're paying, right, for paying the well, payroll taxes. I think cultivators won't necessarily need you to be paying. You think they'll be sole proprietors? If they're sole be, proprietors, yeah. um, I think, uh, you know, I'm not convinced that everyone I mean, eventually this will come up for everyone, especially mm -hmm. when you're paying income taxes. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, they, the tax department said that they do accept money orders, for instance. They do accept kind of these, like, refillable debit cards. So there are ways around it, but I think we should try uh, to encourage in any way we possibly can getting a depository account. Mm -hmm. um, and really think about accommodations for the small cultivators. So th I guess the one caveat could be require a depository account with a financial institution for retailers and then for anyone, everyone else, you know, 
they could demonstrate hardship or we could just have it like this for everyone and if a retailer comes to us their demonstrated hardship might be a higher burden to prove why would their hardship be higher to, what because they're dealing thing? with you know like a small cultivator is probably only, only going to have one major you know oh, an outdoor cultivator because they're going to play the sales tax all the time like that's right they're going to be paying frequency. sales tax excise tax with every transaction mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, I just feel like with that number of transactions and that much cash, like that, that could be a, a real, not just- No, you're right. Uh, like for tax payment purposes, also just a really kind of like dangerous situation having, you know, that much cash in your store at yeah. any given time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why don't we leave it like that and just, in the back of our minds, think about what dem demonstrating hardship could be different for the various mm -hmm. license types. I think that's a good way to leave it, at least I for agree. now. Yeah. Okay. I have one more slide on untruthfulness of the board, but maybe we should just take a break right now and get back to that after a break, just so we're roughly sticking with the agenda that we laid out. I think that's a good plan. Okay, so we'll come back in 10 minutes. Is that about mm -hmm. is that enough time? Okay. No, I still have, yeah. Nelly, you can just let the recording go, I think. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. <laughs> we'll be back in 10 minutes. So last thing um, here, um, untruthfulness to the, to the board in an application or post application process. Um, the first two paragraphs here in the result is from Massachusetts. This is what they do. Um, so any kind of untruthful, deceptive, misleading, fraudulent, um, anything that tends to deceive, um, either during the application process um, or afterwards, is a presumptive negative suitability determination. Um, so it'd be kind of a presumptive denial of the application. I think they have an ability to cure um, but there's going to, it triggers an enforcement investigation and um, can lead to suspension or revocation of licenses. Um, it can result in fines. I think uh, we probably have under a coal memo a responsibility to share that information with um, appropriate state agencies and potentially our financial institutions, depending on the kind of nature of the untruthfulness. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I was talking to OPR about how they deal with untruthfulness and they have, they have kind of a statutory scheme that um, allows for a hearing, um, it allows for appropriate action, and it allows for um, fines uh, per, per incident. You know, if we don't want to recreate the wheel, we could try to just follow that. Of course, it requires us to have, they, I mean, they have their own kind of like um, quasi judicial uh, body that, that overhears that or oversees that process, including four prosecutors and four investigators. So I think we, I think what we can do today is not just determine how we're going to, you know, adjudicate those, um, but we can say that, you know, conceptually that, um, if there is untruthfulness in the or that um, it could lead to an enforcement investigation, a suspension or revocation of license or potentially fines and or. And it will require us to share that info with, you know, state agencies and potentially financial institutions. And we can leave out the one VSA 129A um, for now. And just to be clear for anyone who's watching this, is this is not like you made a an, an error. This is like an intent to be intentional. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and of course, it would, you know, there's various levels of untruthfulness. You know, if you don't disclose that, like you had, you know, 100 unpaid parking tickets. When we asked, do you have any kind of actions against you? It would be much different than if you're, you know, not disclosing your financial interest in another application, right. for instance. Makes sense. Okay, good. Yeah. great. 
And then priority of licensure. Um, I know we have uh, criteria in 7 VSA 903. We, of course, have criteria around social equity applicants. Um, I didn't want the medical patients to get lost in this. They have a separate, you know, currently they've got a separate team of folks that just are continuously updating the medical registry and renewing those. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that we're not losing sight that that process will continue. If we have 100 applications before us, I think we still have a priority to make sure that the medical patients are getting their licenses in a timely manner. So I put that in there recognizing that it's, you know, it's under our jurisdiction starting January 1st. They do have a separate team that's sufficiently staffed to, to do those in a timely manner. But just wanted to make sure it's on the record that medical patients will have will will have their applications reviewed in a timely timely manner for their medical card for their no, medical no, card. For, okay. That's right. Yep. Good. Um, so the seven VSA nine hundred three criteria. I'm happy to pull it up if if we want. Um, uh, but I'll just talk, touch on these other two first. Um, so I think we should have some nod to the kind of order in which these we receive these applications. I think there's certain events that would move a applicant up the queue, but I think we need to have some sort of chronological acknowledgement in in our review process. Mm -hmm. And we could do them in batches, like the first 30 that we receive. You know, we'll do all we'll review all 30 and then license them all in a batch. Um, but I think that at some point, if someone's kind of first in time, they need to have some benefit uh, to kind of getting their application materials submitted t in a timely way. Um, I don't know exactly how much priority we're going to give that, but I think it's important. Um, and then just as, a, again, just a very general concept, you know, I think we need to consider every aspect of the supply chain and the proper functioning of the industry. If we've just done you know, 50 cultivator licenses, we might want to consider doing some product manufacturing, even if they came in after, mm -hmm. you know, the cultivators, we might want to consider doing some retail, you know, we want to make sure that every stop along the supply chain has at least some capacity. Is that different than the, than the timeline that we have? Or are you saying? So the timeline that we have gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, and so I just don't want us to lose sight of the overall picture. Mm -hmm. You know, like if we, again, if we, if we do a lot of cultivation and we know that it's a lot of indoor cultivation, they're going to need somewhere to put their plants in four months. Um, you know, they're going to need a product manufacturer or a wholesaler to sell to. And we don't have any, <laughs> then that's a problem. Yeah. Um, so I just think some nod to us being able to pause you know, things get, you know, complicated. You know, people are going to wonder why this person got a license and not me when I submitted mine over here. You know, I submitted mine back in April and this person submitted theirs in, in you know, October. So yeah. I think we just need to have some flexibility built in that allows us to consider the overall picture. So I'll pull up the 7903 criteria um, just so people can see it. Essentially, this is the priorities that the legislature thought. Kind of hard to see. Maybe this isn't useful. Oh, that's helpful. I lost the slide bar, but oh, there we go. There you go. Okay. So um, the priorities that they gave us, and we need to, I think, probably weight these, um, as in provide like a pointing system to this to, to say whether, you know, how much priority the, these individual criteria will give an applicant, but whether you're an existing medical dispensary in good standing, um, whether the applicant would foster social, social justice and equity. So we would want something like this on our application. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you have a plan, specific plan to recruit, hire, and implement um, development ladder for minorities, women, individuals who've been historically disproportionately impacted, um, 
the specific plan to play pay a living livable wage and then um, environmental resiliency and sustainability and then geographic distribution so i mean i think this warrants a lot of further conversation um but you know it's good to just keep these in the back of our head and you know new jersey and massachusetts and i'm sure other states as well have this sort of scoring built in as well so as you're thinking you know things come in in chronological order and then based on the weighting of these items you might go up or down in that order that's what i'm thinking okay. we might do kind of batches yeah. you know like just so that you know we're not constantly just pushing certain applicants further and further mm -hmm. down the queue like eventually if that's the kind of chronological priority that i was talking about like if you come in first but you don't have anything on recruiting and hiring or you know minorities women um, etc you're not going to get pushed down forever you know you won't get constantly being pushed to the bottom of the pile but um, yeah it's, it seems like I, I think that's a good idea but I think we need to be real clear about um, parameters on dates when we're accepting those right. so that we're not um, either pushing someone down to the bottom of the list for a whole year let's right. say or um, making it so that you know we end up approving applications that have none of these right. items and then maybe not approving a, a minority or women-owned right. business so we'd have to do like here's the first month or the second right. month or whatever that is and I certainly think the, the legislation is clear on social equity applicants yeah. whenever they come in get an expedited review, a priority review. Um, okay, that's it. Good. Thank right, you. One slide. Okay, so one of those, one of those, I think, what six requirements six was on sustainability, and I have taken a crack at in a very conceptual way of trying to think through how we could develop something related specifically to environmental considerations. Um, this might be strictly applicable to this, but maybe we could broaden this to include what I'm thinking um, that incorporates other elements of that statutory requirement of us. There's a lot of words on this page. Fear not, though. So again, this is pretty this is pretty conceptual, and I'm thinking what, the way we could do it is develop kind of like a scoring matrix. Mm -hmm. Each one of these bullets, at least bullets that aren't tabbed over, could be a well-defined area. Um, when, and I did this in the grower context, but I think the same could be adopted for other um, parts of our supply chain. Um, how we could look to um, develop buckets within a scoring matrix that you add up your points to a certain point threshold and you get moved to the front of the list depending on how um, str the strength of your environmental considerations from your growing operation are. Um, so we've talked a lot about operating plans, business plans, something that we could adopt here is a, what I'm calling a sustainable cultivation policy and that looks at the triple bottom line benefits that we would hope to bring uh, for each growing site. When I say triple bottom line, that's environmental, economic, and social benefits. Mm -hmm. Some of that kind of bleeds into some of those other requirements around um, who you choose to hire, so on and so forth. Um, again, there's other there's other kind of attestations or indications that, that may be a part of this and less kind of about your cultivation plan or policy, but attesting that sustainability is a business priority. Um, and you've got a clearly defined plan to actually implement the cultivation policy that you're talking about. And so I don't think, and we haven't talked about baseline um, inclusions at the time of an application where we want to see every single agricultural input or expected way and growing style that somebody would be mm -hmm. looking to grow. But if you want to give us that information and we understand the type of quality product that you want to put into the market, maybe you should get priority if you are willing to provide us that information up front. Um, I have discussed other additional baseline um, water issues that we might not require of small cultivators to understanding how much water they're, they're withdrawing if they're under permit, um, you know, limits, thresholds. If they want to supply us that information, maybe we give them, you know, a point or two or some kind of combination in our scoring matrix so we better understand the real environmental impacts and climate change impacts of your growing operation. 
um, have you conducted a soil assessment, type, composition, and mineral content, and then will you attest to a soil um, test at harvest time to kind of see, you know, what's been uptaken through the production of cannabis um, and how it's impacted the land, both good and good and bad. Um, a grower's production has a neutral or positive impact on biodiversity. You know, these cultivation sites can have an impact on wildlife. What's the type of security? And we'll, we'll be discussing outdoor cultivation security next week, so I don't want to put the cart before the horse. But let's say you have cameras on, you know, that show up when a deer is coming, that there's an impact there, you know? Are you going to plant, plant perennials and, and other, in, or other um, plantings around your cultivation site to encourage pollinators and bees to kind of be you know, present? Like, what are, your, what are your thoughts on sustainability um, as it relates to the cultivation site and how you're not looking to in, overly impact in negative ways uh, the area around your production site? Um, are you going to be seeking a third party certification from an environmental body? Um, you know, there's no, you, you can't get into the organic program because it's, that's a federal program, but there is other, we've heard from them, third party certifiers around mm -hmm. the country um, that are certifying products that, that look to seek um, a higher standard for their quality. And are you willing to undergo environmental audits? Not necessarily conducted by us, but by a private party that would come in and look at your cultivation site, your practices, and you know it on a holistic level to kind of understand how you can do better and we can do better as, as an industry the one thing that i think we need to talk about um now and in the future is is what's the what's the overall purpose of priority i don't think we've talked in this setting about how many licenses will be awarded are we going to allow unlimited license types um to start i think We've all talked about small cultivators and the letting everybody who's well positioned to enter the market enter the market. Are we going to limit license types at the higher levels? Um, so this is separate from not starting with our higher tiers, but the priority and this type of information will be helpful when at the start of our program, when we have a bunch of different license applicants trying to all get their license squared away. But I don't want this, in the, but then after that, what's What's the point? You know what I mean? So how can we provide a benefit to folks continuously um, instead of just having their application become a priority at the top? Because these incentives don't really mean as much if, if it's not an issue, you know what I mean? Past that initial wave where we have a lot of people trying to enter the market. So my thought was, and this is like, I think the, the city of Denver actually does something similar. And I'm going to use very loose terms, but you know, if you're following practices like this, in addition to seeking the priority, they might put, might put a gold star or something like that on your application and certifying your operation. That if you do make a mistake down the road, if you are found in non-compliance with something, you're not looked at with a degree of anything, but you know, you're, you're, you're looked at still favorably. And that's information we could share. You, you can do corrective action plans without fees or penalties that might be associated with somebody who isn't looking to be this sustainable, and that's information we could share with other agencies um, with permits that they might be holding um, that are applicable to a specific grow site. Um, and so, can I ask you a question? Is yeah. that specific to sustainability? So, if you err somewhere down the road in your sustainability plan, or just in in anything compliance related? I was thinking it more broadly. Okay. Um, that being said, you know this is conceptual at this point, and I'm just trying to think how else can we make somebody submitting this type of information to us worth their time and effort other than wanting to sell a high quality product yeah. and differentiate themselves at market with that product so you know and that's something that could be it could be found like i'm thinking about it even in the statutory requirements of what we need to look at past that initial wave of receiving potentially a couple hundred applications what's the point for anybody you know what i mean because there'll be a time where we're on a rolling basis or doing batch applications where they don't need to provide this additional information and they should get their license fairly quickly you know what i mean compared to it out of the gate so can what they are, use it in marketing could they use this and i mean could that would that be a benefit i mean can they use yeah well it? yeah that's kind of like i guess the not not like a certified organic or anything like right. that but i don't know if we could come up potentially with some type of internal 
I said gold star earlier. That's a pretty <laughs> generic term, but you know, some, I didn't see myself putting like a gold star. Right. Well, it's just you know some type of program <laughs> that we could stand up, um, and it could work through other those other statutory, you know, things for us to contemplate when it comes to priority. But you know, what does this mean past the initial wave? Is what I was wondering as I was putting together what I think are some really interesting and cool concepts to help folks differentiate themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always thought <clears throat> you could have a reduced application fee if you had certain criteria, um, you know, like you're willing to grow, you know, you follow some of this, but our application fees, I feel like really aren't going to be, they're low enough that they're not going to be the ultimate barrier, I feel like, and, you know, trying to accommodate some of these um, is going to cost certainly more than whatever we could reduce the application yeah. fee by. So Again, this is conceptual. I'm, I'm happy to keep exploring thoughts and hearing from the public on ways that some doing these types of activities and scoring high on a matrix might help you beyond just getting your license reviewed quicker. Right. Yeah. Um, how can we as a board develop a potential certification style program um, that encourages folks to do so? And that was kind of where. Is there any of this that's similar to the um, discussions around building a Vermont brand for hemp? Aren't, aren't there discussions about that? Like, it's similar, yes, but I, I didn't, um, I didn't take this specifically from, yeah. from that brand. But they are, they are working on that the hemp program, and Carrie and I talked about that, but um, it didn't get much further than that. It's just conceptual, something to think about. Yeah. I think, I think. And just thinking of ways we can prioritize things, um, it would be exciting to see how innovative some folks can get with making sure their their grow site. Again, that some of this can be translated to other, you know, retail establishments and indoor facilities. But how 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 we can keep in mind our climate goals as yeah. a state, and you know, protect Lake Champlain and other lakes that are operating on total maximum daily loads for nitrogen and phosphorus already and making sure we're not a, a part of the problem but a part of the solution when it comes yeah. to environmental conservation. Yeah, that's great. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I think the priority of licensure criteria certainly needs some, it needs to be a little bit more comprehensive I think before we vote on it. So but, Yeah, no, this yeah, is again right. very conceptual at this yeah, point. Exactly. I just thought if we could develop in this specific and sustainable context a matrix with buckets and then ways to hit the five points out of five yeah. points within that bucket. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like doing an, an self-assessment for an environmental audit before you even start, yep. you know, so. Great. Well, what I'd like to do then is Bryn has been listening to our comments, our conversation. I'd like to um, do a uh, subcommittee update, do public comment, and then have Bryn come uh, and join us and kind of walk through the various slides that we can vote on today and the changes that we've made based upon our discussion and then try and put together a package and vote on that. Okay. Um, so why don't we do a subcommittee uh, kind of hopefully one of our last roundups um, about what's been going on this week. And let me pull up the ones that have met. Um, Kyle, did either sustainability or Compliance and enforcement. Compliance and enforcement met. I can go first. Yeah, yeah, sure. Compliance and enforcement met on Monday. It was our last kind of scheduled standing subcommittee meeting, mm -hmm. and then afterwards we'll meet kind of ad hoc as, as issues arise. I think, and we talked about transportation, not delivery, but a continued conversation of the transportation and, and the security requirements within our supply chain as a cultivator tries to get their product to a processor or to a wholesaler or to a dispensary or some yeah. something along those lines. And and we kind of you know I think I think what the subcommittee is really landing on is ha having a baseline, and, and this is like true for just about every, every aspect of compliance and enforcement that we've, that we've discussed, or they've discussed as a subcommittee. Um, having like a baseline and a best practices list for our smallest um, participants in this industry. Um, and so like, for instance, if we're doing outdoor security, maybe there's seven best management practices. Small cultivators would pick one, yeah. of those seven but if you're as you move up your tier your tiers into a larger square footage size you might have to pick three yeah. and then you might have to pick five and the largest might have to comply with all seven and I'm just using that as a proxy to say that's kind of the theme yeah. with all security whether it's retail security transportation security right. um, 
outdoor and indoor cultiva cultivation security, allowing some flexibility for the small cultivators to, and the small participants to, um, knowing their land and they have their own vested interest in protecting their product, deciding what may be best given their specific unique physical location. And yeah. then just making sure that if there are issues, because not everybody can be as rural as others, um, we have some safeguards in place to come in and help folks change, adjust those security measures, do a combination of such if it's necessary that there is theft or diversion problems. So that's really where the subcommittee stood. They just, at the end of this, the charge was create a tiering system for security based off of the size of your operation. Yeah. I mean, to me, it makes perfect sense. Like, the greater the potential public safety risk, the greater the kind of compliance regulations. Yeah. So yeah. that's where they that's where they stood. I, I I heard what they had to say, and we're going to try and see what we can do to turn that into something that that resembles how they approached it. Yep. On sustainability, we we met on Wednesday. We talked about social equity in the context of environmental justice um, and issues around technical and business assistance for some folks that are low income and don't have the opportunity to develop a succinct business plan. And, you know, I kind of gave an update on some of the conversations I've had with certain technical and business providers around the state, like Intervale, UVM Extension, um, so on and so forth. When, I've, when we first started back in the spring, a lot of folks in those industries were looking at ways to kind of compartmentalize their funding, since a lot of them accept state and federal funding. Um, to make sure that they could service this this industry um, and I need to do some follow-up with those uh, sort of organizations to kind of see where they're at that was that was a you know it was a very general conversation Gina was there um, and we talked a lot about the the rental property um, kind of conundrum making sure folks yeah. who want to participate here have the wherewithal to do so recognizing that there may be some consternation amongst landlords, landowners, so on and so forth about this this product being a part of their um, being run on their land. So that's kind of where you know, the conversations. The, the sustainability committee will meet next Monday and next Thursday. But that was kind of our last thematic meeting. We're going to start really ramping up. Um, Jacob is developing reports for the subcommittee members to review of all of our discussions for specific topics related to air, water, waste, so on and so forth, to really um, get a direction and a, and a vote on. So the next the last meeting will be next Thursday. Um, that's great. Yeah, we're winding down. Um, Julie, do you want to do, I think both public health and social equity met. They did. So public health wrapped up this week for now. Um, their last, they well, they did two um, important things. One is they looked at the um, response from the Department of Health on yep. the warning labels and the symbols um, and went through some of that uh, and kind of recommended that out of committee to us. And then um, they also talked about the manufacturing of edibles. And in the end, what they sort of approved was this overarching idea that um, Regardless of who regulates the, the edibles, that you know that there should be laboratory testing, there should be um, you know some compliance and enforcement around distribution and transportation, um, that the packaging and labeling should be cons um, constantly reviewed, um, and that the point of sale flower flyer still needs to be written. And then um, you know they've left the the regulatory piece to figure out yep. to us, which is what's going to um, okay. need to happen. And then. With social equity, they will continue to meet um, for a couple more meetings, I believe. Um, they have moved on to talking about um, diversity equity, or they will be moving on to talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion in, as a broad picture, and having a more um, inclusive marketplace in general. Um, they talked about reinvestment of the cannabis excise tax in disproportionately impacted communities. They made a recommendation that 20% of the excise tax go to disproportionately impacted communities for a variety of reasons. One of those touches on the land piece that you were just talking about, um, education, mental health, and other things like that. Um, and then they talked about uh, cannabis social equity boards that's constantly looking at these programs and looking at the data related to them yeah. um, and the benchmarking for the social equity programs and the, the content of that board. I think they ended up with um, 15 members of, of a board from a variety of different um, perspectives. 
they are actually going to move, um, I think, in November to a time where they want to receive feedback. I think they've built so many recommendations, and now it's time to hear feedback from people who will be impacted by these programs. Um, and so that's the next thing that they're going to plan. Great. Awesome. Okay. So um, the medical subcommittee uh, met one last time. They've really finalized their recommendations to the board. Um, I don't think you'll see any surprises. They haven't given them to us yet, delivered them, but it's all around patient caregiver ratios, plant counts, um, uh, just expanding access and quality of the program. So um, I think there's 14 points and they'll submit those to the board um, probably this week or next. Um, I think they're they're done though. Um, they've kind of adjourned uh, for this regular meeting schedule. The exploratory committee also met. Um, so this is their inaugural meeting. Um, on the exploratory committee is uh, Nader Hashim, Chris Walsh, Stephanie Smith, Jim Romanoff, and Meg Delia. Carrie. Was it? And Carrie. Oh well, yeah. Carrie was there as kind of a, oh, okay. a representative Sorry to, to, <laughs> to walk us through some of the issues. So we have. I called them together to review the recommendations we need to make to the legislature on November 1st. So this is um, whether we should allow production of solid concentrates for use in non-prohibitive products, or whether we should just have them be per se illegal at all stages of the supply chain. Um, so the committee, um, subcommittee, was pretty um, emphatic that uh, trying to dilute them at every stage of the supply chain, these solid concentrates, could have some pretty serious unintended consequences and negative health consequences. So they made a recommendation to us um, that we should allow both the solid concentrates for the use in above 60% um, for the use in non prohibitive products, but then they went a step further and suggested that we should eliminate the solid concentrate above 60% prohibition. Um, and they gave a number of reasons, uh, mostly public health related reasons for that. Um, and um, then they talked about conversion of CBD into Delta 9 THC or Delta 8 or Delta 10. Um, and they, um, so, some members of the subcommittee um, we're kind of on the fence about whether to allow it or not. Others were very kind of emphatic that they do not want us to um, allow that, that it should be prohibited. Um, I think uh, the question from the actual report requirement says, should it be under the purview? Because it's it kind of Delta 8, Delta 9, or, you know, this kind of CBD conversion into these psychoactive uh, cannabinoids um, is a somewhat of a legal gray area right now. Um, the hemp program has said these are not hemp products, so you can't label them as such and we're not going to regulate them. So the question is, do we step in and say that they're under our jurisdiction? And if so, how are we going to regulate them? I mean, one, one thought that was on the table is we bring them into our jurisdiction and we have kind of, we hit the kind of timeout button on them. Essentially, anything that involves this conversion process. Any product that you make needs to be get a kind of approval from us, and then um, we could just kind of pause on the approval process, mostly because people don't know, there's not enough kind of research around the kind of secondary effects or the, the public health impacts of you know these converted products. So, I don't know, they, I think they, um, I need to go back and fully just grasp everything that was said during that meeting, but I think the general thinking was they should be regulated and maybe just prohibited for now. Just, mm -hmm. um, But if, if they are gonna be in the stream of commerce that they need to be regulated by us. And then the last one is just the new recommendations for the Medical Cannabis Oversight Advisory Panel, you know, Jim Romanoff's panel, um, and he actually just sent the final recommendations today. So we can take a look at those at the next meeting before we approve those. I don't think it's necessary to call the full advisory committee together on the uh, November 1st report. I do think that we should send it to them when it's prepared, once we voted on it, and seek their comment. 
Um, but I don't think it's necessary to call them all together um, into a public meeting. Any thoughts on that? I think it depends on how we seek their public comment or their comment, mm -hmm. right? I was thinking we email it to them and we give them a time frame to respond back to us individually. Like as in, you know, reply, BCC yeah. everyone and then hit reply to this if you have comments by, yeah. you know, October 30th or something. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that makes sense as long as we include their comments when we vote on it. Like I think okay. ultimately. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we kind of get to a consensus on what that yeah. report should look like, then send it to them, give them, you know, five days or something to review it. Yeah. And then um, try and incorporate any comments into the final. Okay. Brent, are you um, in the spot where you can yeah. kind of walk us through? Or I guess maybe we should pause for public comment first. Sure. Or it might actually be helpful for you to review everything first. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Because <laughs> if you review it, then people it'll be fresh in people's mind for public comment. I'm on my chair, so I can slide in and out. <laughs> right, so. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of the slides that you just went through because I don't want to deal with my computer and, and um, I'm trying to do that. But I just will start out by saying I think what you, the board should do today is to vote on um, a package of recommendations that you've made, um, incorporating four changes that I heard that you made in discussion. Um, so the package of recommendations that you've made today are on the provisional license requirements, mm -hmm. um, which were in Pepper's slide. There will be one change to those requirements, which was on Pepper's slide five. Um, and that was that, um, and please correct me if I, if I didn't correctly understand what the board decided on, but um, there was a question about tax compliance demonstration, whether or not um, an applicant would have to demonstrate tax compliance. Um, and the board confirmed that you would, um, an applicant would need to demonstrate that they are in compliance with um, their taxes, except for cannabis profits. And profits related to cannabis will not be subject to that tax uh, compliance requirement. Yep. Okay. Other than that, the rest of the provisional license requirements were as recommended in the chairman's slides. Um, the second sort of bucket of things that you decided on were the suitability criteria. Um, and again, those were in the chairman's slides, and there were no changes made to the recommended suitability criteria. One change, sorry. Okay. I did say um, for that fraud, deceit, or embezzlement, then mm -hmm. it'd be a felony conviction. Okay. Fraud, yeah. Generally speaking, and this is not true across the board, but the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony for these property crimes is generally a $900 threshold. So if you write a bad check for under $900, mm -hmm. it's a misdemeanor over, it's a felony. Okay. Yep. Got it. Um, the third category of recommendations that you made were on the baseline application requirements. And I did note two changes to those. <clears throat> the first was, and this is really more of a clarification than a change, um, that Julie's uh, buffer zone recommendations, which were on slide eight, apply only to retail applicants and not the rest of the licensees. Um, and the second clarification was um, about banking requirements, and this was on um, the chairman's slide 10. And that was that, it, that if an applicant can demonstrate a level of hardship and um, demonstrate a sufficient ca cash management plan, then the board can waive the requirement for a depository account. Um, but there will be criteria for demonstrating hardship that will be dependent upon the category of license that the applicant is seeking. Yep. So those are the two changes or two clarifications to the baseline application requirements that you presented to each other. And then um, lastly, you have the additional requirements for cultivators and labs that Kyle presented. And there is one clarification there, which was on Kyle's slide one, 
um, and that is that the rental agreement, if the applicant is engaged in a rental agreement, that the rental agreement be final um, by, this, by the time that they're um, submitting their final application. Great. So those are the four um, sort of categories of things in your package of recommendations that you're voting on today. So the only thing that is left out is the priority of licensing, which there will be more discussion on. Yeah. And untruthfulness, should we just pause on that as well? Um, yeah. Yes. Great. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, I think at this point we should pause for public comment. So um, we have one person in the room. I feel like we you made the drive. You, you should deserve first first crack, but um, other than that, anyone who's joined via the link, please just raise your virtual hand and we'll get to you. Hi, uh, Dave Silverman. Um, I'll try to be fast. Um, in your uh, provisional license requirements, um, James, you um, noted that you wanted to have people list all financiers uh, above 10%. Um, I'm not sure that that, given that you're also going to require everyone who has control, I don't think a 10% requirement is going to add anything statutorily. 10% is control. Um, it's just one indicia of control, and I really appreciate that you've gone beyond that. Um, I, I would recommend that you um, that you require disclosure of smaller financiers as well, uh, because even though they are not controlling, uh, or they might not be controlling due to their um, percentage, they might be indirectly controlling in other ways. And you know, if somebody's a five percent holder, and they happen to be you know the head of the Sinaloa drug cartel, you you want to know that. Um, so uh, you want to know that even for non-controlling people. Um, on, um, on the criminal records and, and the suitability, uh, I had a couple of areas of concern here. And you know, this is one that, that I've talked about with you all before um, that I think is really, really important. Um, I, didn't, I, I noted that you don't seem to be uh, suggesting a look back period for the sort of proper function of the market um, part, but the statute. Um, the statute says that you're supposed to use factors that demonstrate whether the applicant presently poses a threat to public safety or the proper functioning of the market. So it does require that you demonstrate a present threat to the proper function of the market. And so I think that does suggest a, fee, a look back period um, is appropriate. You know, somebody with a 20 year old embezzlement charge uh, with no additional uh, you know, uh, run-ins with a law that would suggest a threat to the market, I don't think should be excluded based on that very old conviction. Um, I, I also want you to, to note that folks who have been convicted of um, cannabis distribution charges are likely to have been simultaneously convicted of money laundering charges. Um, and, you know, whether you consider money laundering, uh, you know, a, a, a crime of deceit, I mean, it certainly is a crime of deceit um, over the financial system, but um, we wouldn't want to deny someone a license because they were convicted of money laundering in connection with selling cannabis. Um, I also didn't see, uh, I also noted that it looks like you're not going to have a, a look back on listed crimes. Um, and look, I get the listed crimes are, are generally very serious crimes, although not all of them. Uh, it is a, a rather exhaustive list. Um, and so, you know, and again, even, even if it's a truly horrible crime, um, you know, I, I think the board ought to be able to, to accept the concept that, that everyone is, 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 is capable of redeeming themselves. Um, after some period of time. Um, so I, I, again, the statute says present threat. Um, I, I think you do need to demonstrate that. Um, you also um, suggested that applicants will have the ability to submit evidence of rehabilitation to the board. 
And, you know, I, I kind of went back and forth in my own mind about whether that's an appropriate shift of the burden, uh, because, again, the statute requires you to demonstrate the present threat. And, you know, maybe, okay, you say they've had these crimes in the past, and so we've demonstrated it, but they can rebut it. Uh, and maybe that shift is okay, but it would be, I think, if you're going to say that, then you should at least try to make it easy for people to identify the kinds of information that they can um, give you, um, the, the kinds of things that you would look for specifically, um, because I think folks, especially people with criminal records, will, will, will just not, you know, folks with criminal records, by the nature of our system, just have fewer resources than everyone else, and so they're going to need more help. Um, I'll come back to buffer zones. I want to talk quickly about uh, priority of applications in the order that they are received. I talked about this a little bit at a, at a market structure subcommittee meeting. Uh, I, I remain concerned there are very few attorneys in the state who are specializing in cannabis business law. They're probably all on this call. Um, and, you know, there's, um, I would think, like, probably a majority of your applicants are going to be served by one or two lawyers. Um, by one firm. Um, and, and so if you want good quality applicants, uh, good quality applications instead of slapdash work, uh, I, I don't think you want to encourage everyone to think, I got to be first. And maybe you can hold off on this decision point until you've seen how many provisional license applications you get, because you, have, you did previously discuss perhaps giving uh, those folks with the provisional licenses some sort of priority review as well. And so maybe wait to see what that universe looks like before making this decision, because I, I really am afraid that you're going to put a lot of stress downstream on the service providers to this industry. Um, and then finally, and thank you for giving me the time, um, buffer zones. Um, you know, I've, I've discussed with the board members before my concerns with buffer zones. I continue to think you don't have statutory authority to impose buffer zones. I think the legislature passed a uh, law that did not include buffer zones after in previous iterations and previous bills they looked at specifically having those buffer zones. There is a buffer zone in the statute for uh, medical dispensaries. The legislature chose not to put that in here. What the legislature chose to do is to give municipalities the right to regulate cannabis businesses within those municipalities through zoning. And I think that's what is allowed. Um, I, I very much appreciate the, the way you've tried to limit your buffer zone proposal to only retailers and to 500 feet instead of 1,000, and to be at, uh, 500 feet along the right of way as opposed to as the crow flies property line to property line, because those things are currently working to prevent medical dispensaries from being in parts of town where we would want um, cannabis stores to be, like in commercial retail parts of towns. Um, and I appreciate that you've proposed allowing towns to reduce from the status quo, um, but I think it's going to be very politically difficult for a town to take an action to reduce a state buffer. And if instead you were to make a recommendation rather than a rule and still require towns to adopt something, I think that would be a better result where towns will do what they want to do as the statute allows them and you're not usurping that authority from the towns. So th that's my recommendation to you and I um, appreciate all of your work and thank you very much for your time. I say uh, we should pause on comments until, I mean, not the public comments, but our pause on our discussion until we've heard all the public comments. So first on my list is Amelia. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, so while we're talking about, you know, application requirements, um, things like how many licenses we're going to give out, I just want to bring a little focus back to the issue of the number of medical dispensary licenses that are currently allowed um, just while we're having this discussion in the legislation we cannot have more than our current number of medical dispensaries until 
we can expand it when we have 7,000 medical patients on the registry. And that's a problem because that leaves us with only the dispensaries that are currently available and nobody else can come in to serve specifically the medical patients. And that is a clear issue. It's been spoken about a lot up until now. But while we're talking about things like licensing and applications, I think it's also worthwhile to mention that this rule is still in place that is keeping people from, apply from even applying to open a medical dispensary. And that needs to change so that if somebody wants to serve the medical patients and only the medical patient community, they should be allowed to. Um, and making it so that we can't even change that until there are 7,000 patients on the registry is ridiculous when patients are dropping off the registry since legalization. Uh, so that was my only, my only thought. Thanks, Amelia. Um, Sherman Hom. Good afternoon. Hi, um, my name is Sherman Hom, and I'm the Director of Regulatory Affairs for Medicinal Genomics. And I'd like to speak briefly concerning my concern in the slide that was presented this morning that was entitled Analytical Methods Work List. I apologize if I misunderstood, but as I thought I understood, I focused on the required microbial testing that listed only two tests, and that was for total yeast and mold and total aerobic bacteria counts. And previously, as, as you know, I've sent in public comments to both uh, Chair Pepper as well as uh, I think her name was Kim Watson, who was the uh, science or laboratory person on the advisory committee, our recommendations to require testing, focusing in testing both the medical and adult use cannabis to detect um, specific pathogens that have been found in cannabis, meaning uh, and more and more state, and those are simply the salmonella species, the shigatoxin producing E. coli, and the four pathogenic strains of uh, Aspergillus. And more and more states are adding these required tests to their um, to their regimen. Um, you know, inhalable products in California. Uh, it's all of those tests, and for non-inhalable products, it's just Salmonella and E. coli in Colorado, in Oregon, and a couple other states have added um, the Aspergillus strains. So I really strongly uh, recommend that you consider um, uh, our recommendations. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. But just quickly on that, because um, I didn't want to signal that any regulatory proposed lab testing decisions were made. I, I was using the hemp lab certification workbook as a proxy for the type of information we would look for from, you know, from just from that perspective. I don't want, I didn't want to suggest that we were Carrie's working on looking at other jurisdictions and tying it to our hemp lab testing program. And so there might be adjustments there. It was more about the schematic workbook itself than, than, than requirements included in that workbook, if that makes sense. Right. Uh, I, I just would like to just point out that simply as a um, support of all the states and countries that are uh, legalizing both medical and adult use uh, cannabis, uh, medicinal genomics has put together a compendium of all the required microbial testing in every state, and it's freely available on our website. It was updated to November 2020, and I am in the process of updating it um, to the present. And so when I was with the New Jersey Department of Health, Public Health Environmental Laboratories in 2019, I put together my own compendium, and there is a lot of diversity. 
but I, I want to just say one thing is to bear in mind is that results of total counts, I continue to just ask myself and ask government regulators in which I was one, what kind of information do you actually get concerning the pathogenicity of a cannabis sample when you just ask for a total count and put an action level on it? In my mind, you get no information. And then that's what I keep trying to understand why so many states have total counts. Not, not, I'm not pointing at any fingers at Vermont or anything, but it is amazing when there is such diversity and we need federal regulation so that there's one set of required testing that's based on science. So, um, you know, if you need any help, just um, open to just having a general dialogue. You know, I was with New Jersey Department of Health since 2012. I started the lab there. I've been in regulations since 2017. And um, now I'm with industry. I couldn't wait for New Jersey any longer. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Sure. Uh, ben, Ben Mervis. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, I'll try to keep this quick. Uh, if my notes, and thank you, by the way, this was great seeing you just get through all this. Um, with regards to tax compliance, um, I, if my notes are correct, I don't believe that tax compliance was a hard and fast reason for rejection, that there would be an opportunity to go back and revisit it. Um, I just wanted to bring up with regards to tax compliance that there are a lot of folks, particularly in the social equity space, who may have complicated tax histories. Um, and so, you know, if it is a hard and fast reason for rejection, including that maybe a carve out to examine and see if an attempt has been made or if a plan is in place to address tax compliance. Um, and if it Yes, it's a hard and fast thing to put that carve out if it's not just to consider that in your uh, reasons or methods for evaluating um, whether or not it's reason. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Bernardo. Hello, I'm Bernardo Silva, policy director for VGA. I just wanted to bring up two issues, uh, the banking aspect uh, for retailers and, and other processors. And then I had another question, I had a question about the uh, priorities list for application. Um, as far as banking goes, um, I'm just going to relate some things from my own experience. Um, Maine, for example, only has one bank that allows for cannabis businesses. It's a seaport bank. Before that bank opened its doors to cannabis uh, caregivers and producers, those uh, businessmen were operating in cash and we were using uh, postal money orders to pay our sales tax uh, monthly because in Maine it had to be reported monthly. Um, that wasn't really a huge burden in terms of safety, especially for producers. I mean, at that time, all producers were retailers doing deliveries. Stores didn't exist yet. And so the emergence of stores kind of arrived at the same time that Seaport uh, opened its doors for that kind of banking. Um, and basically it just gave producers, whether retailers or, or, or just growers, a place to deposit their money daily um, in cash <clears throat> and then have a debit card to spend money on third party businesses, right? Um, or use checks to cover purchases, um, you know, laterally with other wholesalers or producers, et cetera. But before that, um, those people in the market were interacting with each other with cash and there weren't any kind of, there wasn't any theft within the market because they're all registered uh, license holders, right? So background information goes